Paramount wanted foolish ways. Yeah, in a dress. They were ready to sign you on the dotted line. But you just couldn't play ball. Whatever happened to integrity, man, huh? Eddie Griffin appears to have teamed up with Cat Williams to expose the dark underbelly of Hollywood, and he is not holding back. So, what exactly did he say? In a recent interview on Vlad TV, renowned comedian and actor Eddie Griffin didn't hold back as he shared his unfiltered thoughts on the persistent issue of racism in Hollywood. The conversation, marked by Griffin's trademark humor and raw honesty, delved into the challenges faced by black talent in the industry. From questionable casting choices to the systemic bias in Hollywood, Griffin provided a no-holds-barred perspective that left viewers both entertained and enlightened. One of the standout moments in the interview was Griffin's commentary on a new movie about Moses, where he questioned the casting of a gladiator actor as a white man. Griffin humorously expressed his disbelief, stating, How the f*** is the gladiator dude, Moses? Get out of here. This is in Africa, not some small village in Sweden. Who comes up with this? That's like me playing JFK. Eddie Griffin as John F. Kennedy. The actor painted a vivid picture of the absurdity of such casting choices Choices, highlighting the lack of authenticity and cultural awareness in Hollywood decision-making. When asked about some of the most racist experiences he has encountered in Hollywood, Griffin didn't mince words. He pointed out the stark contrast in the resources allocated to unknown white talents versus their black counterparts. Griffin highlighted the disparity, stating, You see the money they'll put behind an unknown white talent just starting out. This observation sheds light on the systemic bias that continues to plague the industry, hindering the progress and recognition of black actors and creators. Griffin reminisced about the UPN, United Paramount Network era, humorously renaming it the U Pick A N Network. He emphasized that many black shows, including Martin's, Malcolm's, and Jamie Foxx's, played a pivotal role in establishing the network. However, once the network gained success, it seemed to vanish. Once this built on our backs, they sell the Where's UPN at? The undeniable truth was right before our eyes, but we opted to turn a blind eye. Feel free to harbor any dislike towards Cat Williams, but he didn't fabricate anything in his statements about the growing trend of men being controlled by Hollywood through wearing dresses in movies. Kevin told you he wasn't going to wear no dress until they offered him the dress, and then he put it on. And what did he say after he wore it? I made my own decision. Duh. But you didn't make it before they brought it up, did you? Okay. While Kevin Hart might be playing it cool and downplaying the whole thing, there's more to it than meets the eye. It's not just about picking an outfit. Even before Kevin rocked that dress, he was squirming at the idea. But you know how it goes. Once that cash comes into play, personal reservations and integrity take a back seat. Money can make people do things they never thought they would, exposing their true colors. And can we talk about Steve Harvey? He spilled the tea too, admitting he'd throw his integrity out the window for a fat paycheck. 10 million for 4 million I'll be all the can stand I black people will be so embarrassed by my performance I'll be digging in my 10 million kiss my I cannot for the sake of my integrity stand up here and let everybody that's counting on me crumble so I can make a statement. On the flip side, Eddie Griffin is singing a different tune, saying it's not just about the money. Man, Paramount wanted foolish ways. Yeah, in a dress. They were ready to sign you on the dotted line, but you just couldn't play ball. Whatever happened to integrity, man, huh? Now, let's spill some piping hot tea about Kevin Hart. It all started when Dave Chappelle, another revered comedian, appeared on Oprah's show in 2006 where he talked openly about his refusal to accept a $50 million deal from Comedy Central. He felt that such deals came with strings attached, and he was unwilling to be controlled or humiliated for the sake of a paycheck. Chappelle's revelations didn't end there. He recounted being asked to wear a dress for a movie scene, an experience that left him deeply uncomfortable. According to him, many comedians comedians had faced similar situations, having to don dresses on screen, and it often coincided with a critical juncture in their careers. This too was a nod to the prevailing industry belief that black entertainers needed to cross this peculiar threshold to advance. Fast forward to 2012, when Kevin Hart was asked about Dave Chappelle's claims during a radio show. While he didn't explicitly say no to ever wearing a dress, Hart emphasized the importance of personal boundaries. He stated that crossing these boundaries was non-negotiable for him. You have to have 
You have to have boundaries. You have to have limits that you refuse to cross. He even cited examples of bizarre requests he had received, such as dribbling a basketball on a talk show, which he politely declined. Hart stressed the importance of protecting his brand and the potential risks of compromising it. However, just a year later, Hart appeared in an SNL skit where he donned a dress, a move that drew sharp criticism from fans. Some accused him of being a sellout, arguing that he had contradicted his earlier stance. The skit portrayed him as a nine-year-old child pope, an image that many believe didn't align with the Kevin Hart they had come to know. The new pope is nine-year-old Oscar nominee, Kevin Cat Williams seized this opportunity to reignite the feud. He suggested that Kevin Hart's actions on SNL were merely part of a larger pattern, insinuating that Hart was willingly playing by the industry's rules to secure fame and fortune. Williams opined that Hart's success allowed him to escape criticism for wearing a dress, as a long line of comedians had already done so before him. At the end of the day, Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are gonna say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. He pointed to movies like Big Mama's House and the Medea franchise as examples of previous instances where comedians had donned dresses. Williams didn't go all out in his attack on Hart. Instead, he subtly questioned the choices made by comedians who aimed for mainstream success. He hinted that some entertainers, including himself and Dave Chappelle, were willing to go against the grain and, as a result, might never attain the same level of fame as Hart. The feud took a heated turn when Kevin Hart, fed up with Williams' insinuations, unleashed his frustration during an appearance on The Breakfast Club radio show. Hart hit back hard, accusing Cat Williams of dodging responsibility for his actions, particularly his issues with the law and substance AB. He argued that Williams had squandered opportunities and positioned himself as a risk to studios, which eventually led to a decline in his career. Hart wasn't mincing words. He laid the blame squarely on Williams' choices. Hart emphasized that he had worked diligently to achieve success and hadn't compromised his principles. He pointed to Williams' own issues, implying that Williams was trying to deflect blame by attacking him. According to Hart, comedy was a serious business, and those who succeeded did so through hard work and dedication, not by succumbing to industry pressures. At its core, this feud became a clash of values and principles. Cat Williams seemed to represent a group of comedians who believed in staying true to their art and resisting any attempts at conformity, even if it meant staying on the fringes of the industry. In the end, that dress did wonders for Hart's career. He's rolling in cash, making him the highest paid comedian ever. In fact, in his recent Club Shay Shay interview, Cat Williams highlighted the astonishing trajectory of Kevin Hart's career in Hollywood by first questioning the unprecedented speed with which Hart achieved success. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold out Kevin Hart show, there being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any well, comedy club. Williams went on and suggested that Hart's rapid ascent was unusual and posed the question of whether Hart had truly paid his dues in the competitive world of stand-up comedy. The comedian emphasized the significance of the journey and questioned whether Hart's seemingly instant success was indicative of a different narrative. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television and had his own movie called So that he was leading, no. In the interview, Cat Williams introduced the term plant to describe someone who seemingly appears out of nowhere and attains success without the traditional struggles that comedians often face, and then claims they are self-made. Williams then drew attention to the fact that Kevin Hart's documentary with Chris Rock revealed his comedy roots on the East Coast. He pointed to a perceived contradiction in Hart's narrative, noting, he just did his documentary with Chris Rock, where he shows you that his whole upbringing in comedy was on the East Coast, so how simultaneously Simultaneously, was he here in Los Angeles doing the same thing? It didn't happen. Williams probed into the inconsistencies in Hart's story, challenging the widely accepted narrative of an overnight success. In any case, Kevin Hart also once addressed the rumors of his overnight success. In 2014, Kevin Hart sat down with Oprah for an interview on Oprah Prime, where he delved into the intricacies of his skyrocketing career and the harsh realities of finding success in Hollywood. Hollywood has a way of making everything seem like an overnight success. Hart explained during the interview. But I've had 18 years in the business. I put in my time. I got dues that have been paid and paid again and paid one more time after that. I stayed true to my dreams and eventually they came true. Oprah pointed out the countless hardworking individuals striving to break into the industry and achieve success. She probed Hart on why he was able to do it 
while so many others faced insurmountable challenges. The difference in me is that I paid attention to what people did before me, whether it was right or wrong, Hart reflected. Everybody that's successful lays a blueprint out. Not only did Hart pay attention, but even back in 2014, he surrounded himself with tangible reminders of those who paved the way for him. From Eddie Murphy to Chris Rock to Richard Pryor, the walls of his home adorned with pictures and paintings of comedians he considered mentors served as daily inspiration. I come down these steps every day. I look at Richard. He was great. I see Eddie. He was great. I see Chris Rock. He was great, Hart shared. It's a constant reminder. What am I trying to achieve? I want to be great. This unwavering motivation, as Hart expressed in the interview, was his belief in what set him apart in Hollywood. What separates me is my drive, he stated. My drive is other people's success. Anyway, Hart is in no way the first comedian to be successful after dining a dress. Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are going to say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. Eddie Murphy is well known for dressing up and physically transforming into his characters, especially women. Murphy played two women in The Nutty Professor, where he performed a total of seven roles. But his most questionable female character portrayal was Rowdy Rasputia from the movie Norbit, who Murphy played as grossly overweight, wearing dresses and bikinis. Another comedian who has gotten successful for wearing a dress is Jamie Foxx. Before he was an Academy Award-winning actor, Jamie Foxx would wear drag to entertain audiences. During his time on the hit television show In Living Color, Foxx dressed up as the character Wanda in comedy skits. Martin Lawrence, like Murphy, is notorious for playing women on screen. On his hit television show Martin, he would play the recurring female character Shenanae. Lawrence wore a dress again on the big screen in his role as Big Mama, completing Big Mama's House in 2000, Big Mama's House 2 in 2006, and Big Mama, like Father like son in 2011. Following in Martin's footsteps, young actor Brandon T. Jackson joined the dressing up act in the movie Big Mama, like father, like son. In any case, it appears Eddie Griffin might have been speaking out of experience when he was speaking on how evil Hollywood is. For context, one of the things that Griffin has previously exposed is Hollywood's role in the cancellation of the UPN sitcom Malcolm and Eddie, starring Malcolm Jamal Warner and Eddie Griffin. The showbiz grapevine had long whispered about the friction between Warner and and Griffin during the production of Malcolm and Eddie. Behind closed doors, their professional relationship was tinged with discord, a stark contrast to their on-screen camaraderie. However, according to an interview with DCP Entertainment, Warner revealed that despite their differences, both actors understood the significance of reaching 100 episodes for a syndication deal. But the network abruptly pulled the plug at 88 episodes. This decision left Warner and Griffin not only short of their syndication goal, but also forced them to part ways with the show they had invested their time and talent into. Fans spoke up about this with one particular fan stating, the network did them dirty. They cut them short on purpose. 12 episodes. They put up with whatever for 88 episodes and couldn't hold on for 12. They are full of they robbed those young men. Another fan wrote, the network knew exactly what they were doing. It is the same thing over and over. This is why it's important to have our networks. Meanwhile, Warner didn't shy away from admitting that the reasons behind the cancellation were rooted in both personal clashes and perhaps racial biases. He candidly pointed out Griffin's idiosyncrasies, describing him as a nut with shenanigans that the network grew tired of. You know, Eddie is a nut. And I mean that in the. Uh, uh, I, mean, I imagine the brothers showing up late, the brothers showing all up. Of that, all whatever. of that. And you're all like. It was a miserable experience. What's more, both Warner and Griffin have openly discussed their dissatisfaction with the writing process of Malcolm and Eddie. Apparently, the series writers were predominantly white and often struggled to capture the nuanced experiences of young black men in America. Griffin, in particular, took it upon himself to rewrite scripts to infuse authenticity into the characters and narratives. This undercurrent of racial disparity resonated throughout the show's production, and Warner's attempts to steer the show toward positive portrayals clashed with the network's predilection for stereotypes typical humor. As Warner put it, he wanted the show to steer clear of harmful stereotypes, but found himself at odds with the writers, producers, network executives, and studio heads who leaned toward UPN's brand of comedy. On the other hand, Griffin revealed that behind the scenes, the truth was far from the rosy picture painted for the public. According to Griffin, the show had two black writers, one of whom was his cousin Mo. However, it was the late Kurt Taylor who stole the spotlight, allegedly being the mastermind behind the show's creation.
Corporation, while Norman Lear reportedly took the credit. To show this was not a standalone case, Dave Chappelle also narrated his own similar experience, insinuating that these are all attempts to discredit black stars. All these people be trying to control you, or, or maybe discredit. For Dave, Griffin experience has helped expose how black male stars are always discriminated against, and oftentimes do not leave the industry clean. Eddie pointed to the tragic example of the late Michael Jackson, a figure who, despite his immense talent and fame, became embroiled in accusations that shattered his reputation. He shared anecdotes about his interactions with the King of Pop, showcasing a side of Jackson that was down to earth and real. I mean, you see before, look at Mariah Carey, made a $100 million deal, and three months later, she's all of a sudden mysteriously crazy. It's the fame. Couldn't stand the fame. In any case, Chappelle's outspoken nature on issues of race and representation in the industry also earned him both praise and criticism. When he criticized the lack of diversity in Fox's approach to programming, he highlighted the underlying racial biases that can exist within the entertainment world. His candid statements challenged the status quo and sparked conversations about systemic racism and the importance of genuine representation in the media. However, Chappelle's relationship with the industry was wasn't without its challenges and moments of disillusionment. He expressed his dissatisfaction with the Hollywood system, citing his negative experiences and a desire to return to a simpler way of life. Chappelle exposed the alleged manipulations of industry higher-ups who sought to control him, using his name and likeness in perpetuity throughout the universe, as per contractual obligations. Beyond that, another conspiracy theory that has long been a topic of discussion is that black male entertainers are coerced into wearing dresses on screen before achieving fame. Several successful black comedians and actors have courageously come forward to share their experiences, acknowledging that they were pressured to wear dresses even when it served no purpose in the storyline. Dave Chappelle stands at the forefront of this narrative, having boldly turned down a $50 million contract from Comedy Central back in 2005. Amidst a barrage of tabloid rumors which accused Chappelle of crack addiction and a mental breakdown, the comedian disappeared to South Africa without informing anyone. However, upon his return, he revealed that he hadn't walked away from the money, but rather from the oppressive conditions that accompanied the lucrative deal. During his interview, Chappelle alluded to the pressure he faced to create socially irresponsible sketches that aimed to make people laugh at him, not with him. It seemed like a ploy to compromise his integrity and put him in a vulnerable position. But wearing dresses was not the only issue Chappelle confronted. He connected the dots between black actors being pigeonholed into such roles and the broader industry mechanism. His revelation about a movie set where he discovered a dress in his trailer, despite it not being part of the script, shocked him. Even when he voiced his discomfort, the writers and producers persistently pressured him, claiming that all the greats had done it. All the greats have done it! So, well, if all the greats have done it, it's kind of hacky, right? You're right. So why don't we just not do it? I don't feel comfortable wearing a dress. After taking a hiatus from the industry, Dave Chappelle returned to the spotlight with a series of stand-up performances that not only re-established his presence, but also solidified his place as a true comedy legend. His comeback was met with enthusiasm from fans and critics alike, as he once again demonstrated his unique ability to blend thought-provoking content with comedic brilliance. Chappelle's performances became a platform for him to delve into societal issues while cleverly infusing humor into his narratives. Renowned for his fearlessness in addressing sensitive subjects, Chappelle's material during this phase of his career covered a wide spectrum of topics, ranging from the political landscape to matters of social justice. This boldness was particularly evident in his choice to address uncomfortable truths head-on, even if it meant challenging prevailing norms and beliefs. Audiences lauded his capacity to engage them intellectually while evoking genuine laughter, making him a standout performer in the comedy realm. However, Chappelle's return to the limelight was not without its share of controversy. His Netflix specials, most notably Sticks and Stones and The Closer, generated substantial backlash due to their content, particularly his commentary on the transgender community. While a segment of his audience embraced his unfiltered and unapologetic approach to comedy, others found his material offensive and detrimental. The divide in reactions sparked extensive discussions about the fine line that comedians often tread between pushing boundaries and potentially crossing them. All in all, Griffin and Williams' willingness to tackle such contentious and polarizing subjects also triggered broader conversations regarding the role of comedians in pushing societal boundaries and questioning established norms. Anyway, that's it for this video, folks. Bye.